Áno, tak uh, myslím, že to bol pre nás všetkých celkom zážitok a ja by som teraz chcel na podím pozvať troch, troch hostí, ktorí uzavrú, alebo ktorých diskusia uzavrie celú túto konferenciu a predpokladám, že veľk, podobne ako prejav, ktorý sme počuli, um, bol o budúcnosti a obsahol veľmi výraznú, výraznú predstavu o budúcnosti, podobne ako, a, ako sme o tom vlastne hovorili pre celej konferencie. A o tom by sme sa chceli, o tom, a, o tom aká tá budúcnosť je, ako si ju budeme predstaviť, čo dneska znamená pokrok. A, a samozrejme, budeme aj, aj sa snažiť a, s mojimi hostiami možno reagovať na to, čo ocnelo. A ja by som ich teraz chcel pozvať na pódium. Je to bývalá premiérka, veľmi výrazná intelektuálna osobnosť Slovenska, pani Iveta Radičová. Druhý host je z Francúzska, je ním poslanec Hnutia en Marche a podpredseda výboru pre európske záležitosti francúzského parlamentu Pierre Alexandroat. A tretím hostom je polský sociológ, intelektuál a šéfredaktor časopisu Kritika politická Slavek Sirakovský. Myslím, že úplne logickou prvou otázkou bez ohľadu teraz na tému diskusie by malo byť na všetkých troch panelistov, aké sú ich, aká ich reakcia na, na, na tú víziu Európy, ktorú, o ktorej sme počuli. Tak asi začnem pani Radičovou. Diskutujeme po slovensky alebo v angličtine? Po slovensky? Takže, dobre. Ešte raz príjemný podvečer všetkým. They are without translation. Translation is on its way. I am lost now. Uh, as a citizen in Europe. English. Is everybody okay with the panel being conducted in English? In English? Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Okay. Democracy result is English. Direct democracy. Okay. So once more, good evening uh, to everybody. I am really proud that I was invited. And thank you very much for your kind invitation and this chance to talk with you and have a chance to discuss some really crucial issues. It's not easy to continue after such a speech. First of all, I have to stay. To sit and react is impossible <laughs> because I lost major dynamic to react, but thank you very, very much, because what we need is to return the belief. Really. We are usually talking that we need to return the trust, but trust is very rational category. But what we need is to put together once more, and I see it in, on your label, the heart with rational way of thinking. So to believe that we still have a chance and that good ideas have a chance to survive. We have experience from the past that if there is a good idea and at least one person each day repeatedly return to this good idea and believe to this idea and talk about this idea the idea is not lost. The death of idea if we start to be silent and look around what's going on. So my impression is your voice, your statement, your dynamic is the way how to repeat and return the basic idea for all of us, of citizens of Europe, to be alive and have a chance to win. So if there are more voices, we have a chance to win. If we are silent, we are lost. It's in, on your hands, you are prepared to give this voice. And maybe my generation uh, can do one important thing, only 
not to be the barrier for you. <laughs> we will try not to be the barrier for you. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Because sometimes when you are alone for a long time, uh, you feel that what you are doing has no sense. And without your inside motivation, there is no positive impact. Because I believe that sense has two pillars. First is that you have to enjoy what you are doing and you are enjoying what you are doing. It was visible. And second thing, it has to be, has to have sense for other people. Otherwise, you are lost in your, not only in your life, but also in society. So please enjoy what you are doing and do it for the others. Then you will win. Alex? Yeah, just uh, give us your perhaps impression of, of the speech and also the vision um, for Europe that was laid out. I mean, first of all, hello everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm happy to be in Central Europe because, you know, for, for French people it's not something so common. So we, with Emmanuel Macron, try to come more often in Central Europe and uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm also very happy to, to speak after Mr. Verhofstadt because today if there is a true European in Europe, it's Mr. Verhofstadt. And if you follow the, uh, what's happening in the European Parliament, if there will not be Mr. Verhofstadt in the European Parliament, you will not hear at all about the European Parliament. So you can very be happy that he's here today. Um, I'm extremely uh, honored to speak after him. And, uh, and, and obviously, I mean, the, the speech he made is, is truly inspiring. Um, it's true that there is a, a wind of change at the moment in the EU. And this is the first wind of change since 15, since 15 years. If you think of... Uh, uh, basically, since 2005, the European Union is in crisis. In 2005, the French people, the Dutch people, they say no to the EU constituency. And since then, we are living in a state of crisis. A few years after, you had the financial crisis, uh, we turned out into the, the Euro crisis, the great crisis, then you had the, the war in Libya, the war in Syria, the refugee crisis, the migration crisis, terrorist attack, ending, ending up in Brexit. And then, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, there was a change in my country with someone campaigning on the pro-European stance, which for our country is absolutely new. It's, absolute, it's a radical change in the political spectrum because uh, in the past, traditional political movements used to campaign only on the, uh, on, on the Eurosceptic stance. So this is absolutely new. And look at the, the change of mood in the European Union since the election of Emmanuel Macron. This is a huge opportunity. And I believe that in few weeks, in few months, in few years, uh, it will be the same in Central Europe because I deeply believe that in Central Europe it's not all about populist, Eurosceptics, uh, anti-migration, um, people who just want to close the border. Europe, Central Europe is much more different. You are the example for that. Momentum is one of the other examples. Novotiesna in Poland is an example. Neos uh, in Austria, and, and I expect much more to come. So um, just continue what you do. Uh, in France will be uh, with this new administration on your, on your support and I'm very here to be with you today. You. Now, Slavik, are we seeing winds of change and how uh, sweeping across Europe and how strong they are? Where, where will they get us? This great uh, mood is scaring me more and more. Um, Guy was so happy, you are so happy. Um, I'm coming from Poland. <laughs> but it's not only about Poland. The thing is, and let me first comment on my friend Guy. First, let me thank you for your firm position, which is quite unusual in you. We are quite disappointed as for the efficiency of preventing uh, anti-European currents and, uh, and phenomenons and you are one of the um, not very diplomatic politicians or not too diplomatic politicians concerning the reactions to what is going on in Europe and, and in Hungary. So thanks for that. Thanks also for supporting uh, the idea of uh, European Federation just for the real Europe. Real Europe means European um, 
state this way or another, but actually you can't be, you can't go any other way in the world with uh, Trump's United States, with China as it is, with Russia, and for many reasons. You cannot really fight with the, all those crises being still so disintegrated as we are. So, so that's that's really good thing. And now the bad things. Um, well, you said and you were even laughing about everybody who are like, you know, talking that Europe is doomed after the Brexit and like, you know, look how, you know, the year ago I would be so depressed, now I'm so happy, we're very happy here. Listen, like what really has changed structurally? Because don't do the same mistake as you just criticized, extrapolating the Macron's success. Like people are used to extrapolate according to you Brexit. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to take only the examples that you presented, um, starting with the, the what, with the French one. Two candidates that went to the second round went outside of the mainstream. Still, it was big no to French political class to what happened in France for the last 20 years. What happened in Austria? Both candidates came from outside of the mainstream. Great that one guy won in the fourth round with one or few more votes. Anyway, I mean, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have a, such a good mood with, with this example. Look at the Dutch example. Wilders, didn't arrive first. Why? Because Mark Rutte, it, last week, and you know it better than me, changed his discourse to the Wilders discourse. What was, come on, he published the letter to the Dutch society entitled, Be Normal or Leave, which was a message to the immigrants and the message to the society that actually, be like us or leave, okay? I'm sorry, but this was the Wilders language. This was the Wilders message. So populism can win not only criticizing the mainstream, but invading, corrupting the mainstream, okay? And this is actually what, what happened um, not only in the Netherlands. I think Slovakia is also not the worst, um, not the worst example, but... Um, um, but also Italian referendum shown that uh, Brexit was not the last uh, what happened uh, in the world. Of course, I'm not going to mention Trump. Um, so this is one thing. My, my second point would be just to like, start like, another, another discussion that maybe, the, well, I think still, and politics is about alternatives, about a conflict, about the main conflict. And the main conflict today, unfortunately, probably is not progressive or populist, but is between enlightened populists and national populists. It's not easy to be a populist. Well, there are, not, well, there are, there are many good analyses showing that those biggest opponents, Trump and Macron, actually had some features surprisingly similar, though I'm a big fan of Macron, and I'm also happy that he's so firm as you talking to Kaczynski and about Kaczynski. Thanks. Thank you very much, Slavek, for that um, critical and more sobering, sobering tone. It, it is indeed needed, uh, and it's important to be, um, to be articulated. And which brings me also to the, um, to the Central European and perhaps Slovak context as well. Now, even if we accept the premise that there's a when the winds of change are sweeping across Europe and there's a new progressive uh, movement or movements, uh, which is something I'm, I'm personally inclined to believe, believe being the operative word, but then Central Europe is still, perhaps given its uh, history and particular political context, um, perhaps there are certain challenges that are not, not present in, 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 in West European countries. Maybe not. So I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Radicheva, how do you see um, the, the optimism that's uh, being felt in Europe and perhaps the rise of 
you know, progressive movements such as Macron, can it, what will be, what are the chances of that taking place in our, in our region, in, given our political culture and our political, um, our political system? I don't know if I know the answer, I only put something on the table for discussion, because it's not an easy question. What we know, and I am sure you have had discussed it during the day, that very naturally, when you widespread freedom too much, there are limits. And then there is natural reaction on the type of liberal demo democracy to create opposite, more close societies, to create more security, except freedom, etc. It's very natural reaction. So we are facing really now what we can call global anti-globalism, international nationalism, and popular populism. As a reaction of last 50, 60 years. Uh, we can react in two ways. One way is to criticize everything and to offer something totally new. In history is nothing totally new. Because present day is history and future. Is past and future. It's nothing totally new. Plus, it's very dangerous. Because then you say that all your lives, my great big generations, were for nothing. You are more than lost generations. You only uh, put your effort to totally destroy societies. In other words, we, I think that the progress meant that, first of all, I am able to define continuity what was okay, what we have established as a pillars of new kind of societies or present kind of society. And I have to stress that we had something made. You are trying to keep freedom of speech. You are fighting for this because you have created sometimes freedom of speech. We have created and other kinds of freedom, freedom of privacy, freedom, etc., all kinds of human rights. Why we are now so sensitive? Because somebody is trying to cut our freedoms. And doesn't matter from what side. So from my point of view, first step is to define continuity. What we have established as a pillars of human dignity, as a pillars of our society, and from my point of view, is really whole concept of human rights. Then, sorry, second thing, briefly, we are open society, open to new ideas, open to new movements, and we try to offer something for the, for the future. We know really what are the problems. I think we have to start this strict identification of what are real problems uh, in the society. And I think that, and I will mention three major. First, in political system, uh, there is a shift from the dispute on social economic differentiations among political parties and systems to the dispute on identity. Identity, either national, regional, global. Danny Rodriguez mentioned it as trilemma. National sovereignty, democracy and globalization, and the answer is you never can have to get, at the same time all three only two different combinations. So you, but you have to then decide and to build it. So in political system, we really need to return the belief to the real democracy through the real 
participation of citizens in political system. There are several possibilities. It's not only direct democracy or referendum, many others. But we have to return citizens, we have to return democracy to them. In socio-economic system, yes, there is real gap in between global market on one, one side and national politics on another side. That's why we need integration. That's why we need European Union. As there is no balance in between these two powers. We are like small aquarium fish. Uh, national politics towards global market brands. There is no chance. So the only way is so-called global, global local. That's it. Because realization of global is on local level. In socio-economic, one last point, very important. This struggle in between global market and very weak national politics in this relation created new social inequalities, which citizens understand as non-justice. Look at our budgets, Minister of Finances, who every time have to say no, why? Because higher public expenditures, higher redistribution, and more social inequalities, something is deeply wrong, systematically wrong. In building our concept of welfare state, in other words, we have created whole generations dependent on social redistribution. Stronger state in this sense, but state with low authority, low authority, lower trust of citizens, and also lower trust to the politicians. So there are challenges to change and implement totally new measurements. And last but not least, management of the state and public, public sphere. Uh, te te new technologies, globalization, technocratization of whole our bureaucracy uh, meant by the stronger bureaucratic uh, administration, uh, administrative bodies, entities, which are not responsible, but they are doing decisions. Uh, and doing these decisions without responsibility is the field for corruption. Open field for corruption. Uh, plus new invisible power, not only in economy, but mainly in public administration. So new public management, it's not only friends, digital and e-government, it's not enough. Not enough. We can discuss more about this issue. So three major challenges, political system, socio-economic uh, challenges, and public uh, administration. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, interesting that you speak of the future in terms of challenges in terms of problems that need to be addressed, that need to be redressed. Now, part of uh, why this panel was convened and the main theme is, is, is to, to ask what, what is progress today? And you mentioned in, your, in the beginning of your introduction that, uh, well, first of all, we need to cherish what we have and defend what we have, including human rights, um, all generations of human rights. Now, I, I would, would like to ask Alex, um, whose, whose movement, um, um, I must say, sort of campaigned against continuity in, in a way, right? It was a, it campaigned on a platform of disruptive change in the name of progress. Um, so in, in that sense, I would like to, him to respond perhaps, if progress is, if, first of all, defending what we have, or is it um, something more radical? Sorry. Basically, why we, why we built this movement? Why we created it? Because uh, the political life, was locked from inside, was locked by those traditional movements who were in power for, uh, I mean, after the Second World War. Um, and they were locked from inside and they did not allow people from the civil society, from the businesses, from the think tank, um, from the NGOs, from the agricultural sector, from education, to go into politics. 
And the way we won this election, uh, this radical way of winning this election, because I just, I just remind you that a year and a half, this movement does not exist. And a year after, it was Emmanuel Macron was elected president, and a month later, we had a full majority in the parliament with 314 new members. Why this radical change? Because those in power locked it from inside, and the outsiders were not able to go into politics. And so we try to reply, to respond uh, to a form of continuity in holding the power for generations and decades. And we try to build something outside of the traditional political movement, uh, because the traditional political movement had been built uh, to respond to the challenges of the, after the Second World War. And they have not been able to make their aggiornamento, as you would say, um, and to respond to the current challenges, to the political challenges, um, to the economical challenges and to the social challenges, to the political, they locked it from inside. They, those who should have defended the European Union, except Mr. Verhofstadt, did not do it. No one defended the European Union. No one. Those who should have done it have not do, done it for 15 years. Uh, on, the economical, uh, on the economical side, in my country and many countries in the EU, we have not been doing the reforms that we should have done 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. I'm 30 years old. And since, uh, since I'm born, uh, I hear about uh, unemployment, uh, um, uh, cr economical crisis, etc., etc. And this economical situation, this no reform of our countries, uh, has led to the social situations that I know today in my country, where part of the society has been absolutely put aside, uh, not, integra not integrated into the society. So, indeed, there is a form of a continuity that had been. A, uh, existing in the political system in my country and in some other country, and we came uh, and we had to build something different outside of the traditional part of the traditional movement. So we built a new movement, uh, not a movement uh, uh, from the center right or the center left. It would have been pointless. Uh, we built a movement with women and men from the right and fully from the right, from the left and fully from the left, from the center and fully from the center, from the civil society and fully from the civil society. And this gathering of people, this is what we, what we call the progressist, somehow. Because the progressists are not from the left or from the right. The progressists, uh, they, they, they are everywhere. And why the traditional political movement were not able uh, to reply to the exceptional circumstances that we face today? It's because they were absolutely broken from the inside. Not able to, to find a common line to, replon, to respond to the, to the crisis of today. Um, if you... The traditional center-right and center-left movement, they don't discuss about ideas or platform anymore as we do today. They just discuss about persons. Who will be the one running the list? Who will be the one running for the presidency? Who will be the one who will be leading the list in this region, etc., etc.? They don't discuss about ideas anymore. And that's why my country and many countries in the EU were blocked and were not able to, to go forward. So we had to do something out of the, of the traditional political spectrum. So when we debate about uh, progressivism and stuff like that, it's difficult to define what is progressivism. But the reality is that in many countries in the EU, we are able to come out of this political spectrum that we are locked from inside. That's why we try to do. Um, and I hope it will work. Thank you. Um, I'll ask um, our <laughs> most critical panelist, uh, Slavik, do you, there's obviously lots of uh, discussion about the traditional ideologies and traditional political identities such as centre-left and centre-right being in decline, um, losing legitimacy. Um, and you also spoke about the new conflict being among enlightened populist and then the worst kind, if I remember. So what, what do you say to the thesis that, that indeed what we come to know as you know, social democracy versus centre-right conservative parties, is that you know, over in Europe? Is it, is it in decline? Or um, and what is the answer, if, if that's the case? What's the response? If you heard my friend, then you know the answer. I mean, it was very empty right and left. We are beyond left and right. We take everybody. We um, are critical to the traditional um, movements, party system, uh, and so on. This is actually what I would call, but positively, don't, don't say, you know, populism is a word invented for the left wing, you, you know, the left was traditionally populist. This is actually quite new that we lost populism. You know, 
what is the left now? The left is now more elitist, establishmental, you know, like it's more about the people who are like, has much bigger social capital. Social capital is about the classes. The class division is mo mostly about the competitive, uh, about the, you know, the, about the social capital, how, what you can understand, where you can really participate and where, and so on and so on. So this is exactly, um, but this, this is exactly the division I think uh, it's more updated now, the enlightened populist and nationalist populist, only, probably because the only way to prevent nationalist populist, someone like Le Pen, someone like uh, probably also Kaczynski, is someone who would um, also appeal to the same fears and emotions that are inside the people. Okay, because this is it. If our progressivism will be an abstraction, okay, and will not appeal to the people, um, then we will, then let's be philosophers, but let's don't talk about the politician, elections, and so on. If you will have a good answers for moral questions, but we won't have an answer in election, then we're not doing politics, okay? Act, act, unfortunately, it means some ugly choices. Like, I will give you the worst example, immigrants, okay? If your people, you know, fifth, Poland is the, it's not Euro-enthusiastic society. It's Euro-fanatic society. 88% of Poles are happy with the accession to EU. You won't find these numbers anywhere, okay? But in the same time, Poles asked, do you, would you resign uh, from the European funds, uh, or what would you choose? Accepting immigrants or resigning from the European funds? We are the biggest beneficiary in EU. We got 14 million, billion uh, euros every year, okay? 58% of Poles said no immigrants and no funds, okay? Poles asked, would you then prefer leaving EU then accepting immigrants, 51 said, okay, let's leave EU. And Poles don't have even one immigrant, okay? Poland is in the same time the most homogeneous society in Europe, okay? Um, excuse me? In modern history, let's, let's put it this way, of course. Definitely, and most tolerant in the same time. Exactly. We had no religious wars. We had like no the things that the entire Europe. Actually, why the the the, the why Poland was the fatherland of uh, of Judentum? Because Poland was the most tolerant society for many centuries. It's now the opposite. Okay. To have a liberal democracy, we need liberals. And uh, to be a liberal, you first of all you have to feel secure. I'm, 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 I, I, I like very much what Mrs. Ivacheva said at the beginning. Like, if market, if economy is globalized and politics is not globalized, people will feel insecure and will define this asymmetry of power between the market and, and, and the state in the insecure way, okay? This is why I like the idea of the Verhofstadt European answer to balance economic globalization <laughs> as, a, as a, at least partly on the size of the continent to build a global politics, okay? Supranational politics. Thank you for also bringing us to the topic of Europe because it is my sense, that is in, our sense in, in progressive Slovakia that, that any vision, any positive vision of the future or any notion of progress must be defined and, and, and pursued in a European context. I mean, there is um, I would think that I can't think of a vision of the future which, which is not European for, for us, for our countries. Um, and, and let me therefore, uh, but this is also a not, it's not an easy, uh, easy notion in our region because, I mean, obviously we've been part of the European Union for, for you know, over 10 years now and we are getting comfortable. But it, but it seems to me, and I want to ask the panel what, 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 what your thoughts are, that we still are struggling to find uh, our place in, in, in Europe and our role in, in 
European progress, thinking in European terms and where Europe could get. And I think our, our nations, including Slovakia, are still struggling to find, uh, you know, define the role for us. What, uh, what is our responsibility? What is our contribution? Um, so if, if I could ask you, what, how would you, uh, what would you say could be the contribution and the role of Central Europe in European progress? Hmm. I do not think that we can move on moon. Uh, we are here in the center of Europe and we are part of not only European networking, uh, we are part of world net networking, we are open. And I will answer, if you do not mind, with one example. There is performance on Slovak National Theatre called Natalka. Uh, the story of really xenophobia and racism against one small girl. Very strong story. At the end of this performance, there is always discussion. And there were young people in, in the theater, and one young, maybe 16, 17 years old boy, gave the question, oh, come on, for what this democracy? Maybe somebody like clever Gaddafi, isn't this better solution? Discussion, choices, look, then there is no order in the society. We need order, then will nothing like this have happened. I do not know if I reacted correctly in that moment, but what I have done was I have asked him for his mobile. Please give me your mobile. You will not need it, as I will close society, I will close, close information, I will close all your servers, Google's technologies, I will decide what is the truth. You will have one newspaper, uh, there, there, when you will read my speeches, then you open state television, when you will hear my speech, speeches and see my face, etc., etc., and then I will transform transform all public media to state media. In that moment, I didn't know that two weeks later, the head of our national parliament start to speak, started to speak about state television. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I thought in that moment that how, how it's near joke and not reality. It's always near reality. It's sometimes, as we know from Slovakia, one night and the end of democracy we are facing. So sometimes maybe the main aim and goal is to prevail normal human dignity, human beings and our human rights. That's it. Uh, we are now looking that we need new idea. What kind of new idea? New God? God is God. Uh, new ethic? The principles are clear. What we need? To tolerate each other? To understand each other? To be solidar to each other? And to say the truth? That's all. And if the big idea is the society based on tolerance, human dignity, freedom and truth, then I think it's enough to start really to implement everything we can improve. This is for me progress. No, I think that's a um, very good definition of progress. And um, but I'll just before these these will be the last questions from me, and then we'll, there will be uh, there will be an opportunity from um, one of you from the audience to to comment and, and pose questions to the panel. Um, and and I'll have a similar question to to uh, Pir Alex. Um, what then is 
how would you define, you know, progress in Europe, say in, in, in perhaps a longer time horizon? And a second, smaller question, in viewed from France, what place does Central Eastern Europe play in that vision? Okay, well, uh, I'm, I will, I will answer the, the second question first. Um, well, if I speak uh, from my perspective, Central Europe has a key role to play in the European Union. Um, I said that because I used to work with people from, uh, from Central Europe. Uh, I said that as well because I come from a country which honestly um, decided at some point of its history not to take care anymore about what is happening uh, on, the, on the eastern border of Germany. We divided Europe into two pieces. We said, basically, the Germany will take care of uh, Eastern and uh, Central Europe, and us, the French, will take care of the Mediterranean uh, uh, region. I think it was a wrong uh, reading of the, of the European Union, um, and I think the, the way, but maybe my, my colleague on, on the left will disagree, but the, the way uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, went into uh, Central Europe and, uh, and, and, and Eastern Europe recently just demonstrate, because it was the first time for a long time that the French president did it, that we want Central Europe to play a key role, that we want Central Europe to come with us in this reformed Europe that we, that we carry, um, and that we, we expect very much to, to have you on board. So in, in my personal uh, um, I mean, my personal feeling is that uh, the, central, the central Europe is, a, is a essential for the, for the future of the EU, that uh, obviously there is an engine in the European Union with, which is Germany and France because it's the two big member states uh, with the strongest economy, which are the, the most populated people, but that if we just consider the European Union as France and Germany, it's a mistake. It's a mistake, and uh, I, I mean, I come from a country which says in 2000, and, where the president in 2004, Chirac, uh, when speaking about the war in Iraq, said that basically uh, Central and Eastern countries missed an opportunity to shut them off. He said it very bluntly. Uh, it was on the war on Iraq, then we, we won't debate on that. But this is not the way we should have spoken at this time. And since then, there was a fracture, there was a, uh, a break between Western or at least between France and the rest of, of, uh, of Central Europe. And you guys were just in the European Union a, a year before. So, I mean, from that, how can you build a, a relationship? So with this new, uh, this new government, this new parliament, that's why I'm here today, uh, we want to, to uh, develop this new relationship. That's why Emmanuel Macron has been there. And, and that's why we, we are trying to do. After we can, we can speak about the debate, that the way it is, and stuff like that. But there is a will to, to bring Central Europe with us, because for us, it's extremely important. And, uh, and, and we know that there is something behind what we hear in the medias in, uh, in France or in Germany about aut authoritarian populist regimes. There is something else in, in Central Europe. So we, we, want to take, we, want to take, we want to have you on board with us. Uh, on, the, um, on the notion of progress, uh, extremely, ex I mean, difficult question to answer. But I mean, f for us, uh, the way we see, um, or the way I see progress in Europe, there is a division between those who believe uh, in the rule of law, um, those who believe in justice, um, the place of uh, universities in our society, the role of researcher, of thinker, of philosopher, of politics, of people who belong to the civil society and their role into, into politics, and those who oppose this vision and say um, that basically there is no future together, that we should go back to national member states, um, that Europe is not an alternative, that the only alternative is national borders, um, uh, out of the, of the EU, out of the Eurozone. Um, for, for me, the, the real future, the real differences between those who believe in progress and those who don't believe in progress, and that was the difference that we make in this campaign, is the, is the belief in the European Union. Not the European Union as it functions today, as Mr. Verhofstadt said, and some others said before, but a reform Europe. Uh, and if we are able to build this reform Europe, um, I think this is where we'll make the difference between the progressive and those who are somehow, let's say, the, the conservative. Thank you very much. Um, um, just one final, I, I already see that there's an interest uh, to, to pose questions. I'll just very briefly, Slavic, to you, when, when Pierre Alex was, um, was saying that the new French government, the new French president are keen to have 
Central Europe on board with this project of reforming the European Union. And so my question would be, is, are we up to it or are we interested in it? In it, or should we be? This is the problem because uh, we are not losing now. I mean, we Poles and not Hungarians, we're not not losing uh, uh, this opportunity to to shut up. And we're talking all the time, also fighting with Macron, fighting with the entire world. Um, and then, of course, the, this is very bad. And probably, well, you have a big discussion now with Europe. You have France. You have Macron's project and Juncker's project. I'm not sure if it. Um, just to put it very, very shortly, so like, unfortunately, because of the attitude of Poles and not only Poles, the Macron's project can end up with a Europe of not only two speeds but two classes even. But it's not going to be the fault of France or Germany. It's going to be a, our own fault. Um, and the second thing is Juncker's very optimistic idea. Let's go together and let's force actually our all countries to join Eurozone, which I would love to for political reasons, not necessarily economical reasons. For Poles, Euro probably is more political question than economic question. It's a question of security, democracy, independence, and so on. I have to disagree with you as for, I just published on Friday, you know this text, okay. Okay, I published in Le Monde the, the piece criticizing Macron, which I thought that I'm not gonna do, but I see, as you see, I'm criticizing all the time. I will take, I'm, but it's only, uh, um, it, it's really an exception. I'm very progressive and optimistic. <laughs> um, and, uh, but the thing is that, of course, Macron came to Europe uh, to fight for the posted workers uh, di di uh, directive, so to change the, to t change the law. And unfortunately, this is why I criticize him. I support him very much when he criticizes Poland and when he uh, asks Poles, Hungarians, to be democratic, to respect rule of law, and so on. But, when, but as long as he doesn't use this critic, to push French economic interests. Because roping the critic of Polish political nationalism in the promotion of economic French nationalism, it's not an honest uh, position, let's face it. Don't mix those two things. Criticize us for what we do with democracy, but don't uh, use the fact that we are isolated in Europe, so people should uh, ignore us and like our workers and should pre you know, prefer French workers or so on. Here, I think, from, especially from the progressive perspective, I would go and look what, what is the interest of people. So these workers, not necessarily Poland or France or politicians. To answer... Um, um, Okay, let, I, I'll maybe finish here because, like, uh, if you want me to tell you what's the progress, you won't hear it, maybe. <laughs> okay, no, it's, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. If it would be so easy, we would, you know, need, wouldn't need a conference. Um, but Mrs. Radicheva has asked for one sentence. Um, I know that in a liberal democracy, there is, if there are complicated things, one answer, easy answer is wrong, but still I will try one sentence. The role of the politicians and politics is not to show to the people what to hate and how to hate, but to show to the people what to enjoy and love. So this is the progress in politics. That's it. Okay, I'll uh, now open the, the floor for, for questions that I think there's, there's an interest in the back. Uh, if you could um, give the microphone to the gentleman in the back. Hey, thanks a lot. My name is Martin and I've got a question for you, Pierre. Um, so when you want to change a country as the prime minister or as the president, you need to do two steps. Right? Firstly, you need to win the elections and Secondly, you need to maintain that popularity and to actually perform what you uh, promised before and to actually do the steps to change the country. Um, and with Emmanuel Macron, um, he, so he obviously managed to do the first step, but now it seems like he's a bit failing in the second step, like his popularity is going down and many people say that the, um, the power is like grasping him. So my question is, first, could you tell us what's happening? And second, could you maybe tell us um, 
what could we learn from this? Like, what could people here or the party for the future, you know, once, once they become the government, what could they learn from this, like, to prevent uh, something similar happening? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This is a, this is a good question. Obviously, there's just something on, on what we have, uh, we, have, uh, we have been thinking over the, the past weeks. Uh, to, win a, to win an election is something, as you said, uh, and then to govern, as Mr. Mrs. Prime Minister knows, it's something different. Um, the fact is that the country haven't been properly reformed for many, many, many years, since I'm a kid, uh, and even before. Uh, and, and the truth is, is that we are doing a, a set of reform which are extremely uh, um, radical, somehow revolutionary for the country. Um, and that obviously a part of the political opposition um, is building up an agenda on that. And somehow creating artificially, in my point of view, a kind of disagreement between the French society and the policies we are doing. In my point of view, there is some kind of uh, uh, unsatisfaction, maybe. It's possible. But the truth is that if this unsatisfaction was that high, um, you will see uh, 300,000 uh, people in one day in the street of Paris, as it happened already in the past. But what is doing the opposition today? There, is, there was one or two demonstrations last week. There will be another one this week, another one the week after. Why do they do that? Because they are not able to gather people. If you are strong enough to gather people, you gather them one day in, one, in the same street, in the, in the same city, and say, look, the people are there, they are against your reform. So in my point of view, um, there is some dissatisfaction, but not everybody voted for us. Um, so this is one thing. The second thing is that uh, um, people are waiting for a change in the country. And we campaign on that. But the truth is that once you are in place, make, doing reform that I've not been doing for many years takes time. Takes time. And we said it very clearly in the, in the campaign. All what we are doing now will have effect in five or ten years. We will not change radically the country from one day to another. We change it politically. Now we change it economically, socially, uh, maybe philosophically some, somehow, but we, we, we will change it, but it takes time. And Emmanuel Macron has already been saying that we need to look what, which kind of, of country and union we want in 2030. It's not the, 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 the country France tomorrow or the day after. It's what society, what country do we want uh, in, in few years. So it takes time. And, and maybe we have not been explaining sufficiently what we are doing, so we, need, we try to do it more at the moment. And one final word. Me, I'm ready to assume a part of unpop unpopularity if the reform we are doing are good for the country. I think it's time that the politicians stop to look every day on the polls, on the, on the, on the, on, on the curb of their popularity, um, and, and say, ooh, I'm unpopular, I stop to do everything. That's what we have been doing for many years in the country, and that's why we are in this situation. So we assume a part, I personally at least, assume a part of, of uh, unpopularity if we are delivering, delivering good policies. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you very much. Is there a... Wait for the applause. There is a question uh, uh, there in the back, the la lady. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here and also uh, listen to great discussions today. And especially, I would like to thank uh, Iveta Radicheva for being here and also not inspiring me, but many other women and people that are around. Being a fighting woman for the human rights as example of democracy. I am very grateful to have a person in politics like Iveta Radicheva and also being here as a maybe future help to not only Slovakia but also to Europe. And uh, I hope you will inspire not only women in the future to fight for others, not, on, not for for, for self, like we see at 
at the moment the political scene of Slovakia. And uh, I would like to ask Ms. Uh, Ms. Radičeva, what would be your message to progressive Slovakia? Because I think you are not just here because you were invited, right? What would you say to, to do better and from your lessons learned in the past? Once more, thank you very, very much. Thank uh, you. You are very kind concerning evaluation of my position and what I have done. Thank you very much, but it was really kind. Uh, message. <laughs> you know, uh, I am not a good example of leader at all. Really not. <laughs> so don't copy <laughs> the way of my leadership because, or copy, it depends on you, because I really prefer the politics of solutions, not the politics of fights. I prefer negotiation and not the use of power. I know that power is a service and not the aim. Uh, I, for me, the power is something I really need to have to promote something, but openly I do not like it. I prefer more participative type of politics, very equal type of politics and not the hierarchy in the politics. I prefer open politics uh, based on the truth, also in the situation where it's very inconvenient. Uh, I prefer to try to have a partner with whom I disagree and not to have an enemy. I think that politics uh, which polarized society and create enemies uh, meant that we are losing a sense for community. And without sense to community, we are alone. And we cannot be happy if we are alone. So how I see it is please, Put your whole effort to build communities, not only virtual, but real communities. Please return to the basis and basic features of politics, negotiation, trying to find the compromise and be tolerant to those who disagree with me. And last but not least, I think that the aim of each politician is that when you finish your journey, at the end there is at least one more satisfied citizen more than before you have started. So my message to you is to have more and more satisfied citizen at the end of your trip. Uh, do it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think this is a very good note on which to end our, our discussion and indeed the conference. And but I'll uh, invite uh, Ivo Stefankor, chairman of our board, uh, to, to, have, to deliver a closing remark. And, and thank you uh, in Slovak language. I would, but uh, before I do that, please uh, um, give a round of applause to our to our speakers, Ivata Radicheva. Pierre Alex Anglot. and uh, Slavik Sirakovsky.